Thank you. Okay. It was, uh, was actually me second joining. All right. Okay. Yeah, it should record now. <laughs> okay. So, um, right. So, uh, audio quality of, of, of many of the presenters has been a challenge, you know, in some of the meetings I listened to in before. So, you know, if you're presenting, maybe, you know, um, get yourself a second, uh, you know, audio channel like a phone or so, just in case the, the inline audio doesn't work. Um, make sure your video is uh, off normally. If you're presenting, please uh, feel free uh, to have your video seen by the others. I think that should still be perfectly fine from the bandwidth requirements and otherwise I think um, people can chime in on the chat um, if they are having problems with reception bandwidth. Typically it's it's descending bandwidth. Um, right, mute your microphone unless you're speaking. We may mute you uh, if you're kind of, you know, not noting that you're causing problems. Um, and so before you're speaking, um, please uh, check that you are unmuted. Um, the WebEx chat is only for uh, the Q, uh, Q&A and questions. So every one of the presenters, uh, please indicate when you um, would like to be interrupted or not. Typically, I guess, um, if somebody doesn't say something, we'd do it at the uh, end of the presentation. And uh, I'm just looking at the, I'm, I'm checking the chat on the second screen so that we know when somebody wants to say something. Um, the Etherpad. Um, Here it is. Yep. I'll share your screen. I, oh, wait a second. Is it not? We are say your face, but not the, the slide. Okay. okay, thanks for the reminder. Um, let's see. Yes. Who are you? Maybe you turn off your camera. <laughs> Yep. So it should be shared now. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, suppose. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This 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 was also the outcome of joining from the second notebook. I apologize. All right. Etherpad. Um, the logistics is there. Um, the agenda is there. And uh, so I'm just bringing it up now. Um, it's not shown yet. I think there is some delay. Oh, that's not good. Starting sharing, but I'm sharing the screen. I brought up the, uh, the Etherpad, but I'm seeing on my second notebook that it's not. Uh, we see virtual logistics. Now we see your face. I would just leave your camera off, and now you're muted. So let's start to share again. Screen. Okay, so I'm switching video off. Let's see if that helps. Uh, so here is the Etherpad, uh, all the same logistics that we said, agenda we're going through. And please, um, you know, just in the normal ITF blue sheet, please add yourself to the list of attendants in the Etherpad. Um, you know how it works. If uh, we don't have a uh, long list of participants, the virtual meeting room will be smaller next time. No, well, I I haven't seen your screen yet. So I'm seeing uh, actually on my second notebook that it is without sending video is now fairly quickly uh, following uh, me changing the different screens. You should now be seeing again the virtual meeting logistics. Yes, it's there. Okay. okay, and any form of discussions, uh, please on the Java room um, and not on the chat. So that's the virtual meeting log logistics. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to chime in here during the chair slides on any of the logistics. So we'll make sure that everybody can participate well in the meeting. ITF note well, I think uh, you're all aware of this um, and it applies equally to any of these uh, virtual interim meetings as it attends it uh, applies to uh, the in-person meeting. So unless you step out and go to the hallway jabber, um, you know, everything is meant to be public and all the BCP um, applies. All right, so, and this is back to the standard slides. So um, we 
primarily need a uh, minute taker. So can we have anybody chiming in here? Uh, Shane, did you look up for anybody who, who we could have do that? I did volunteer. Volunteer? Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I'll yeah. just say that there's only three of us in the Jabber, not including any chairs. Yep, I'll, I'll join to the uh, Jabber as soon as I'm through with the uh, chair slides and, and, and help there as well and the Etherpad. Um, right, so we've got the slides, we've got the WebEx. So um, I don't think we need a, a Jabber slide, a Jabber scribe, given how the presentation needs to be so that everybody remotely can follow it anyhow. Okay, so standard uh, chair slide deck. So um, here is just the list of working group documents. We're just not going to do a lot of it today. Um, I, I'm going to give an update about the autonomic control plane, which is the you know pretty much the last one of the slide of of the uh, charted documents that we're hanging on uh, to and. Um, that will be at the end of uh, the session now because um, the IESG telecall is still on the first hour, so um, Eric Winke can only join in the second hour. Um, so then for the bootstrapping key infra, so Michael said no uh, need to do slides. It's almost fun. M Michael, do you simply want to uh, jump in with one or two sentences? Um, I, I read an email that said that asked the Secretariat to publish from the ISG this morning. Excellent. That's that's a great success. Thank you very much for all the hard so work. Maybe at maybe at nine a.m. when they wake up, uh, nine a.m. Pacific when they wake up, that'll they'll push the button, and I guess it'll happen. Oh, great! So for next time, somebody has to figure out how to do the uh, virtual champagne. And uh, yeah, and then of course we have the poor uh, documents uh, waiting in line. So we had some discussion um, with Brian about you know the dependencies, but let's take that. I think after uh, this virtual meeting if, if we need to change any of the strategy on how we're dealing with our cluster here um one question um mm -hmm. michael do you actually have the dependency um uh, to the sap i mean um, i believe rescue. that i i i would have to double check if it was a normative or informative but there is a there is definitely a link to it to acp Okay, if it's normative, then uh, you may join us for the waiting for ACP. Hopefully, that will come next month. Yes, I, I'm pretty sure it is normative, okay, and I and and uh, uh, I I believe we're in the second uh, IETF last call, but it's already been through IESG, right? So um, yeah, I'm going to to give that update in in the ACP presentation. Yeah. I just wanted to start taking notes for the administrative stuff. I need to follow up with that too. Okay, so the one slide uh, we never gave, but um, which seemed to be good. So that was coming from me stealing slides from um, another working group. Um, for those folks who uh, you know have recently joined and started to work with uh, within Anima, um, we do have a GitHub uh, URL is there. It's very informal. I'm not sure if uh, ITF has any more formal things about GitHubs right now, but um, I think, you know, and Michael started uh, this GitHub, so um, he may want to chime in, but I think we'd be more than happy to have any, you know, additional work that people feel um, relates to Anima, whether it's a working group document or else, you know, software, um, anything uh, related to it, uh, use that uh, GitHub. So uh, please simply reach out to the members of the GitHub to get added to it. Michael, any more uh, insight? Uh, it's probably lacking some of the predates the GitHub uh, how to, um, and we certainly aren't using it consistently across drafts. But it's, I guess, um, I think it's got all the right pieces. You guys have control, and Bob Wilton's in the queue. Are we yeah. doing queuing? Are we doing queuing in this working group? Is there enough of us? Uh, yeah, uh, Rob, please uh, chime in. Uh, yes, um, so I was just on the GitHub stuff, there is a couple of drafts that have just gone through the ISG on GitHub. One is configuration um, guidance for uh, Secretariat Citadab. There's another one on guidelines on how to use GitHub with choices, the 
the working group in terms of how they want to manage projects in GitHub. So it might be worth having a look, of, look at that draft uh, and seeing if there's bits of that that you want to adopt for either general process or for particular drafts. But uh, I think it's up to the working group to decide exactly how to do it. They're just recommendations. Um, on the question as to whether you need to use the queuing or not, that's up to you. If there's, if there's not, not enough people, then don't stand on formality. Yeah, so I would also say that, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll just say, uh, I'll raise the, the need for the queue as soon as I see too many people are talking at the same time. So please uh, chime in whenever you want right now. Yeah, so um, I, I guess we'll just, you know, stick to be informal here and then, um, you know, somebody will hit the chairs procrastinating on reading the GitHub RFCs. And so then we'll do that and uh, then it'll become more formal. Okay, so uh, here is the, the agenda. Um, I think we may be having to skip uh, one document. I think I was uh, missing uh, one slide deck in the morning, but I think we can take it uh, uh, offline for the moment. We have some decks in before. Um, and yeah, that's the end of the chair slides. Um, any more agenda bashing, additional items you would like to discuss? once and twice all right so let me find the uh, first thing which is uh, Bruski AE and bring that up and I can um, drive the slides no should be the PDF oh should be the PDF right uh, okay and here we are uh, view full screen. Okay, and uh, please tell me things like next slide or so for me to move on. Okay, perfect. So, I uh, uh, would like to give an update on the Brisky, Brisky IE draft, which is currently in version 03. Uh, and the co authors are Henrik Brockhaus and Elliot Lear. And uh, you can go to the next slide. So, um, the next slide basically describes the problem statement, which has been also discussed during the last IETF meeting. So uh, the draft provides an introduction about different uh, industrial scenarios, which uh, may have problems with the current approach uh, that is described in Brisky, because there is uh, there are some uh, situations where we have uh, limited online connectivity to backend services, like a PKI, which is used during the the onboarding or enrollment, or oh, there are sites which assume only uh, limited on-site PKI functionality, so like. Uh, a uh, an LRA instead of an RA, where the local uh, a local registration authority, uh, while the RA and the backend performs the final authorization of the certification request. Uh, new in this draft is the introduction of a scenario where we have limited connectivity to a register, and I will come to that one later on. The the main contribution that the draft provides is to utilize authenticated self-contained object objects for the certificate enrollment, more or less in a similar way as being applied for the voucher handling. And the intention is to be transport independent using that, that approach. So next slide, please. So the changes from version 02 to 03, uh, there are some, some smaller changes like the, the update of the terminology used. So currently we use self-contained objects. Uh, or authenticated and, and authenticated self-contained object is basically the, the uh, object we are targeting. The intention is to say we have uh, an object that provides proof of possession and proof of identity. So that is an uh, uh, explanation we also use in the in the draft. Uh, the naming is uh, yeah, more or less out of the box, so we can also think of alternative names if, if authenticated self-contained objects is too, too long or too awkward. We could also use something like attestation object. Uh, there are some editorial improvements. I, I simplified the picture that we have for the for the initial use case with an offsite PKI to avoid showing complexity in the offsite PKI, like an inventory management or something like that. And the main part or the main change from 02 to 03 version was the introduction of the new application scenario using also the, the approach of uh, authenticated self-contained objects or situations where we don't have an online connection to a registrar. So this requires some changes in the call flow sequence. We may 
need to discuss some trust relations or trust assumptions that we have for that. Um, great. So you can go to the next slide then. So this is basically a repetition. Uh, the the notion of asynchronous of of, of uh, asynchronous enrollment utilizing authenticated self-contained objects basically relates to we would like to have objects that bind the proof of possession of the private key like we have in the in the normal PKCS10 or the CSR and additionally the proof of identity uh, to be transport independent. In the current approach, uh, it is it is not ruled out in Ruski to use uh, EST with full CMC request. Uh, but what we what we address here in Ruski uh, A is uh, to to be able to utilize different options of existing enrollment protocols or utilizing even other enrollment protocols that provides this uh, self-contained feature. So what we in addition need is some kind of certificate waiting indication. If the contract contracted RA or the registrar is not able to issue the certificate at the same time when he gets the request. So the, the document basically lists the different requirements for handling those self-contained objects. And the intention is to be agnostic regarding the actual enrollment protocol. That's also one reason we utilized the, the well-known uh, naming for uh, to, to enable other enrollment protocols in the same way like we have it right now with EST. So the next slide is uh, also some kind of repetition. Sorry for repeating some of those things, but uh, we moved the main uh, main scenario that we had in the draft uh, so far to uh, to use case one. This use case one describes uh, the offsite PKI components. So it's it's just a smaller change in the original figure of Ruski, where we uh, basically ripped out all the PKI components and put them in the backend domain or in an offsite domain. And there is a connectivity to the onsite domain, but that may be only temporarily available. So in that respect, uh, we would need some kind of possibility to store uh, certain information on the domain registrar and deliver that later on to the PKI. The PKI itself needs to be able to make some authorization decisions. So there would be a need to have the, the initial identity and the initial authentication information of the pledge when onboarding the new domain available also in the offsite PKI. So that is the approach where we use those authenticated self contained objects. Um, right here. Um, so if we go to the next slide, and just one quick comment, right? So it would be nice in the um, in the graphical thing to have a little bit more distinction between what are online communication protocols versus um, you know offline steps taken of, of communication. I guess the dropship is uh, well, yeah, not 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 quite clear where the offline stuff, right? So the difference because this picture looks pretty much the same as from Bruski, right? Right. So the difference is that the the uh, rectangle. Uh, in in the original document comprises not only the join proxy and the domain registrar, but also the PKI. And we uh, ripped out the PKI here and put it underneath as offsite domain components. And the offsite domain components comprise the registration authority that is uh, performing the final authorization of the certificate signing request and also the CA. So the domain registrar would, would more or less act as local registration authority. Right. But we can without we can no, no without repeating the original picture, maybe there's just a little bit more visual mm -hmm. hints to give what, what the new part is here. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So on the next slide, uh, that is the second use case we just introduced in the in the uh, recent version uh, of Ruski AE. Um, that is the uh, case where we have the pledge not directly connected to the domain registrar. So there may be different reasons for that. One might be that the pledge doesn't have a, a connection yet to the domain registrar. Another reason might be that there's a different technology stack, uh, but uh, that technology stack would also use certificates for authenticating the pledge in the, in the domain itself. 
So what we introduced here is a pledge agent to decouple uh, the pledge from the domain registrar. And an example scenario might be if you have something like a building automation network and uh, you have certain installations of fire detectors, fire sensors in the basement, and uh, there is no connection yet to the to the uh, domain registrar, which might be part of the of the rest of the building automation system. So the service technician more or less would go to the seller, fetch the different uh, information necessary to onboard the the different pledges, so the the fire sensors like the voucher requests and the certificate signing request and uh, store set on the pledge agent and then as soon as he has connection to the building automation network he can forward those uh, information objects to the domain registrar for further processing and then uh, once he gets the answers from the domain registrar he can step back to the to the seller or to the basement and provide the information to the to the pledges so that is uh that, that also would allow for a bulk onboarding of devices. So assume that in the basement where you have no connectivity, there is not just one pledge to be onboarded, but a couple of pledges, so a couple of fire sensors, basically. Okay, so in the next slide, we have uh, the potential call flow, the potential changes that we uh, discuss in the draft. So uh, on one hand, uh, we, we introduce the pledge agent here, and the assumption is that the pledge agent talks with a domain registrar and uh, utilizes the typical Brewski approach. So he can find the domain registrar using the same discovery mechanisms, and he has a connection with the domain registrar, which is also secured by TLS. So the communication between the pledge agent and the pledge itself maybe from a transport perspective uh, be vendor specific but the information objects that are exchanged uh, those are uh, to be standardized so the information objects here are the the voucher request which is already part of of Ruski, and also the uh, certification request uh, what needs to be done by the pledge here is to trigger the pledge to perform certain operations so that is why we, we also call that the push model so the pledge is pushed to create a voucher request uh, there uh, we have a discussion if it is necessary that the pledge agent provides a proximity certificate from the domain registrar already to the pledge at that point in time uh, if he does then the pledge can insert the the uh, proximity cert already in the voucher request then the pledge would be triggered to uh, uh, create a certification request. Uh, optional here is the delivery of attributes for the, certific the certification request. Then uh, as soon as the pledge gets this information, he can basically build the communication up with the domain registrar and then forward the request to the domain registrar. So this is one difference that we have uh, introduced here. So the intention is to have the pledge agent as agnostic as possible. So that means uh, in the current model, we are, we are not expecting that the pledge agent utilizes an IDEF identifier to authenticate towards the register. So that this type of uh, authentication uh, might be done by utilizing something like an authentication on, uh, on HTTP, for instance, of the service technician or of, of the uh, user operating the pledge agent towards the domain registrar to basically authorize uh, or provide an, an authorization option for onboarding devices based on the pledge agent. So uh, I, I just put in a, a TLS arrow in there because uh, all the information exchanges uh, that are being done between the pledge agent and the domain registrar would follow the Brewski approach. And as soon as the pledge agent has the necessary information, that means uh, the voucher and also the certification response, so the certificate, uh, he would provide that information down to the pledge. The pledge uh, on his side can verify the voucher as soon as he accepts, or as, as soon as he could validate the voucher, he can accept the, uh, the domain registrar certificate. Uh, 
uh, as as trusted certificate on his own site and then validates a certificate that he got from the uh, pledge agent and uh, if both is done he can provide the voucher status and also the certificate confirmation which can be fetched by the pledge agent and then uh, provided back as a telemetry option that Bruski provides. Yeah, I see that uh, Elliot is lining up there. So from my point of view, we, we can we can take questions in between, so that's perfectly fine. Good afternoon uh, to everyone. Um, and uh, thanks to, uh, for, for presenting the straps, Stefan. Um, the only question, the only, the only comment I wanted to add was that um, at mostly I, I view this draft as being more about EST than about Brucey. And so it's a slight misnomer in my view. But other than that, I see this as a, a, a good extension to uh, make Brucey uh, a little bit more robust uh, and EST a little bit more robust because uh, not only will these requests have to occur um, you know, during registration, but of course, it'll have to occur if the certificate's about to expire or, or for maybe other reasons as well. So, um, yes and no. So, uh, yes, in the context yeah. of, I'm sorry. Hello. We like the word yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, my, my connection here, I have a more or less narrowband connection, so I hope uh, everything that I said so far came through. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I, I think it's not just a, a pointer to EST here to, to uh, more or less specify uh, the full CMC or, or to, to yeah, specify the full CMC request as part of EST. Um, it's also the change of, of the sequence uh, in Brewski by fetching the voucher request and the certificate request at one point in time and delivering both at a later point in time. From the call flow, I don't think that this really uh, disturbs anything of, of Brewski. The only thing that I think is, is uh, a matter of discussion, uh, how do we authenticate the pledge edge agent? Is there a necessity to have an authentication there? Or can we simply rely on the authenticated self-contained object, objects that are exchanged between the pledge and the domain registrar. Okay, so we, we could go to the next slide then. I have one question. Um, so with this being very specific to, let's say, EST, maybe Brewski, right? So whether or not you want to adjust the name, that kind of is what I heard implicitly from, I guess, what um, Elliot is saying. Um, the larger question to me is, you know, uh, is are there principles in there that, you know, go beyond applying it explicitly to, you know, EST and Brewski? Because, you know, we already have alternative uh, protocols in the IETF, like NetCon oh, yeah. Zero Type. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, very good question. So the the intention that we had with the first use case was to open up the possibility to also utilize other enrollment protocols, uh, and uh, that is reflected in the adoption of the well-known scheme uh, to to basically allow other existing enrollment protocols in there as well. So that that could be uh, CMP, CMC, or it could also be the approach. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure how far advanced that meanwhile is to utilize OSCOR for certificate management. Right. So the problem really is that we don't have a clear, you know, separation in our naming so far between Brewski the protocol and Brewski the kind of architecture, right? So we call everything Brewski and maybe, you know, one of those naming issues to, to solve through, right? That this is good extent then as you say more about this whole bootstrap architecture in as a right. the protocol itself but you know I, yeah. I i'd like to leave it up to you know somebody like michael or others to come up with you know maybe suggestion how to unconfuse our naming yeah that that would probably be good if uh, i mean uh, right now if if uh, the brewski rfc uh, 
will come out in the next couple of days, hopefully, then um, the name Brewski basically reflects the overall protocol approach here, not just that's that's my understanding. So basically the combination of the voucher exchange with EST or with, with an enrollment, let's call it that way, with an enrollment and uh, actually, I don't think that's entirely true, right? So something like, uh, you know, uh, you, you could easily, you know, um, build a Brewski architecture solution with Netcon and Zero Touch, for example, but that's not covered by Brewski, the protocol spec. So that's, that's, that's where I'm coming from. So, so I, I guess what I would suggest for this, this is Elliot, I apologize for interrupting you. My network is a little flaky, uh, so please bear with me. Um, is that I think what Stefan has proposed here is actually um, it's a pretty good architectural capture, if you will, of the issue, and he's given very specific uh, guidance in a couple of cases. Um, I propose that the word, I mean I'm, I know I'm jumping slides on on Stefan here, but I propose that the working group adopt this with the idea that if there are other examples that need to be identified and included, we just do that as part of the development of the draft. Uh, okay, let's, let's go to the next slides because I'm, I'm just starting with, with the discussion and the open issues. And that is obviously one of the questions that, that we, we need to ask there. So uh, those are, so some of the questions may already be very specific for the use cases that are described there. So um, one, we, we don't, we probably don't need to answer that question right now. So one is the pledge agent authentication authorization issue in use case two. So the intention actually is not to require the pledge agent to have specific credentials. So you can think in the easiest form, you can think of the pledge agent as something like a, uh, an app that you have on your on your mobile phone, for instance, to, to allow for onboarding. And the mobile phone may talk, for instance, Bluetooth to the pledge and uh, IP to the to the registrar. Uh, and if there is only the, the information object described, like the voucher request object and the certificate request, then uh, it's fine to, to have some kind of end-to-end -end security by sticking that to the, to the uh, information object exchange. What would be interesting if uh, the thing that I mentioned that the service technician that does the onboarding has some kind of authorization uh, that he shows towards the registrar, but this can be done by using uh, a user authentication, basically. This is something that we can we can uh, discuss in, in the draft. So there are, it is already named or stated in the draft as, as question or as proposal. But this is something that, that probably needs more work. Um, there is a second question connected with that. Uh, if we provide the proximity registrar certificate to the pledge uh, from the pledge agent. So if we do that, then I guess we need some kind of additional authentication by the pledge agent that the pledge agent, uh, that the pledge knows that he's talking to the right agent. Uh, that is what, what I would, would expect there. And this type of authentication may make the, the pledge agent uh, a little bit more complex. Uh, so if we assume that the pledge agent is coming from the, from the vendor, then uh, the pledge could probably authenticate the pledge agent very easily by, by validating a certificate if it is issued by the same vendor CA. But uh, if we think on something like a universal commissioning tool that may onboard uh, the pledge independent of the vendor, then uh, there, there would be some steps necessary to equip the pledge agent also with a, with a kind of credential that can be validated during the onboarding by the pledge. Again, those two questions, I think there are more related to the further proceeding of the draft then. So, uh, on the next slide, uh, we have uh, the addressing scheme. Right. So this is what what I mentioned, uh, Tolas, as as you ask. Um, so the 
uh, we, we basically leverage the notion that with a well-known approach or with a well-known scheme. And uh, we currently have the notion of well-known slash uh, enroll protocol or enrollment protocol request. And uh, the proposal is to change that to well-known and then just enrollment protocol and leave the, the remaining part of the addressing uh, to the enrollment protocol itself. So EST has some, some notion of that. Uh, there is some further notion in the lightweight CMP draft, which also provides uh, utilization of, of the well-known scheme there. So therefore we would just uh, state enrollment protocol and not uh, any specific commands that are uh, to be executed by the domain registrar there. Yeah, thanks. That 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 goes way beyond the level of detail I'm I'm currently grasping. I think the um, I think that uh, this is probably fine for you know Bootstrap. Um, I guess for me a little bit the question is you know how would this go further on into something like ACP, where for example for certificate renewal we're currently you know mandating EST as the you know mandatory to implement. And so if we basically broaden ourselves beyond EST, I'd have to think about how that trickles over to ACP extensions as well, I guess. So uh, I think that in a lot of the use cases that uh, Brewski AE is addressing, um, I don't think there will be an ACP, at least on the, the initial thing for the, the case of the rail cars and the uh, housing construction. Um, it seems unlikely that there will be an ACP when the devices are provisioned. There might be one later. Um, and I also think that the certificates that are provisioned, the LDEV IDs that are provisioned into, say, a home, would probably have a two to five year um, validity period with the assumption that when the first owner takes possession of the keys of the house, and this would this is both literally and figuratively the keys, that they would then rekey everything. Because that's what you do when you buy a new house, right? You change all the locks. And so that, that now they would then pro provide some EST or CMP renewal function uh, when they essentially restarted their home controller with a fresh factory defaulted thing and then provide the keys and then it would take over getting rid of all the construction companies identities out of it does that make sense yeah, well, it definitely makes sense to remove the word key and replace it purely with how about certificate renewal and you know i could start uh, you know complaining about my tivo again which doesn't have certificate renewal so all the certificates are expired and you know um i don't think that uh, Re-enrollment, which I think I heard you saying in a period of two to five oh, years. No, no, solution. not enrollment, not re-enrollment, re-keying. Okay. But that also would then have to basically be, you know, understood to be required to use exactly the same protocol that would be used for the initial enrollment. If we go in... If yeah, some, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but that, that enrollment could also signal that the home controller, the one that they've the, the, the owner has has bought saying, yes, I have to re-enroll the furnace with CMP and the refrigerator with EST, at which point I'm letting them both know that we're doing X. Okay. Or it's going to have, or, or if the devices don't support X, then it's going to have to keep using the one that it was enrolled with. And the controller's got to speak multiple protocols. And that's just tough because the industry couldn't decide. Well, let, let, let me just say that, you know, I inherited a lot of pain trying to specify all the certificate rekeying renewal for the ACP. So if we go further on and especially saying there is no ACP and we don't, you know, specify those pieces here, then, um, you know, these solutions will not work after the point where rekeying would be required. So I'm not so, sure. If so let me, so let me, let me suggest yeah. that an industrial association like the building association may write a document similar to the ACP document that specifies how that works. And that if I bring a, a commercial fridge to my home, that I may have the problem that the commercial fridge consortium decided on a different protocol than the con home construction consortium. And I have to do something magic, right? And, and that may be intentional market 
you know, what is it called when you split up the market? Um, yeah, there's a word for that. That may be intentional or that may just be the where, where they each went. But but I think that for the moment, I think that 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 the enrollment specification is not that complicated to write outside of the space of the ACP. If you just needed to write that part, it's not that complicated. But it might be that Brewski AE doesn't need to specify it uh, itself because it's better done in an industrial document. Of course, no, no, but I think that what would be good to say is if you want to build in this document, if you want to build a solution out of that, there is a dependency adopters need to specify, which is kind of the rekeying after the initial enrollment, right? That's how I understood you. Yes, that's what I said. Okay, cool. So, so just, just to give an example from a different domain in, in power system automation, for instance, uh, there is also uh, the case that the infrastructure needs to support two different enrollment protocols uh, because there was a request to, to support different enrollment protocols for, uh, let's call it historic reasons. So one is GAP, the other one is EST. So we ended up in a situation where the infrastructure has to support both enrollment protocols while the pledge or the, the enrolling entity in that case can choose. It's not nice. But uh, that is a compromise that was was uh, taken there. So this is all a lot of fun, and hopefully we can take the discussion to the list. But unfortunately, unfortunately, my the uh, working group chair, you know, uh, woke up in me again and looked at the clock. So okay, uh, uh, so, so sorry for for keeping the discussion running. So that's that's the last slide. So uh, it, it mainly describes uh, the the next steps that are envisioned with the draft. Uh, the goal is to reuse the Brewski architecture elements as much as possible and uh, just to adapt, for instance, the sequences from the from the Brewski document, but reutilize uh, all of the different elements. Uh, we currently work on a proof of concept for the use case too, uh, together with a pledge agent. And uh, the last question is basically the question that uh, Elliot was raising before. Is the working group in favor of adapting that work as working group draft? So, yeah, so I don't think, has anybody actually seen good uh, experience with trying to use the raise hand thingy here in uh, WebEx for, you know, if you're doing, you know, want to do an adoption call at least? No, I'm not sure if it. Michael, have, have people tweeted? Can we put this another way? Um, this is Elliot. Uh, Toros, my suggestion this, this draft's been presented several times in this working group. Um, and maybe the way to do this is a negative request, which is, does anybody object to um, its, adopt, its adoption at this point? I don't know. The, it, it, can we take this this offline? Because you know the process is much better than I do. I would definitely that's just right. do an that's the, that's the consensus the question. That's what the consensus document says you should do. Okay, let's, can we take this offline? Um, just as a process, I was just checking be, be, beside, obviously, you know, an appropriate adoption call on the list, which we must do anyhow, whether anybody has seen a useful way to, to call the virtual room here on WebEx. If not, then um, let's not try to do this now. There is the race hand in WebEx, but I haven't seen people trying to use it successfully. That's all I was saying. It's Robbie. So no, I don't think there is a good way of polling on WebEx at the moment. But I think that's also fine to do that on the, on the working group list. What I sense so far is uh, that there is an interest to further work on that issue. I, I also think it's fine to actually ask the question here in the meeting if there's anyone opposed to adopting this, just to see if, if anyone is. I agree it still needs to be taken to the list regardless, but it seems like a valid question to ask. Uh, chime in now or later when we're on the list. Okay, so let's move on to uh, the next uh, agenda item. I think that would be um, information distribution. I think I just saw it already. Presenter, please step forward and uh, take the mic. Can you hear me? Nope. You need to bring up the level a lot more. 
Now can you hear me? Is yep. it better? Yep. Okay, great. great. Uh, hello, everybody, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, I just present a very brief and short administrative update. We're fading last... out. Also, could you please uh, introduce yourself? It's uh, it's not clear which of the authors. I'm Xun Xiao from Huawei. Uh, I'm also the one of the, also of the, the working group draft. So now today I just present a very short and brief administrative update about this draft. So you can go to the next page, please. Yeah, uh, so this is just a sh short recall about the content of the draft. Uh, again, uh, we are focusing on our new module to provide the entire information distribution and functionality for the ASA. And also this draft also consider some, some possible or necessary extension about our um, draft protocol. Uh, yeah, so here the green boxes are our focus on this draft. Um, okay, next phase reading, please. So here, um, basically summarize the, the major change that we made since the adoption. So first of all, this draft was adopted as a working group document um, in this library. Uh, so and we and after that, we immediately provide a zero zero version. Although we didn't provide any uh, too much technical update, uh, the major change of the draft is that we basically collected uh, all the comments and that appeared in our mailing list and we summarize into the following three categories. So the first one is that um, some reviewers or, or um, and you must you know, suggest that um, we should you know put more references to, to, to the use case in the inter, in the in, to the introduction part. And probably we better position um, uh, with the content and our uh, our requirement in the context of the connected car. And probably this is a more suitable you know use case to to, to illustrate what are the main technical you know point of this draft. And also we can consider some use cases from the firmware update and so on. So this is the first category. Also, uh, the second one, uh, we were suggested to, to rethink or refine our terminology, which we quite agree, of course. Um, and we should also somehow better align um, with those pre-existing um, terminologies that are already used in, in the other NEMA documents. So we will also do that. And the, the third point is that we should also provide more protocol behavior description. Uh, probably we put uh, too much about the implementation part, for example, what kind of uh, API messages or parameters must be extended in order to support our proposed functionality. Uh, but we focus uh, a little bit less on the generalized description about the, the protocol behavior. So we will also do that. So yes. so. Basically, uh, this is our major change um, about the very initial version of the working group document. Okay, uh, please go to the next page. Thanks. Um, just, just quick audio check, right? So, um, can you try to make sure that you're not breathing that much into the microphone? Just can keep it steady at a, at a good distance and uh, not too close. I think right now you're holding it too close, but try to keep the level up. Okay, is it better now? I think you need to always talk a little bit longer before we hear whether you're breathing into the microphone, but the level is a little bit low. Sorry for that. Okay, 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 no problem. No problem. So, uh, so in general, we are uh, we will we will of course you know we will, we will of course gradually address all the collected uh, the comments and provide a new version before the next IETF. And we are we are also you know. Partly, you know, planning and um, our kind of uh, very simple prototype to implement such a proposal in order to, at some point, you know, demonstrate our proposed functionalities. Yes, we are still in some discussions. Yeah, that's all. Uh, you can go to the next page. Yeah. 
So, so again, thank you very much uh, for the support about the adoption. Uh, we will keep working on that. Yes. Yeah. Um, from my side. Yeah. Always remind the working group that this work is going on, and you know, if there were last time any open questions or now, just remind in mail. Yeah. That, that people will exactly. continue to respond. There is always things falling over. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. If there are any questions, please ask them now. I'm trying to already get prepared for the next one. Agree. Were no questions about that? I didn't hear any. Okay. Yes, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, uh, you said, uh, you need to please introduce yourself. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear us? Yeah, yes, I, I, I hear I hear you are speaking. And uh, my name is Jay Yang. Yeah, please uh, uh, see the next slide when you want to move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, uh, let's begin. Let's begin. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, and uh, um, OK, let's begin. Uh, to enterprise customer, uh, I think has already in standard deploy solution. Uh, meantime, during the network deployment for higher uh, reliability to service uh, continue, the usually design multiple and uh, uh, redundant network uh, link between devices like the right to, uh, to case. But the ACT is IP-based architecture, so there lead some challenges in uh, creating ACT in their two uh, existing network. Next slide. Next. Hello. I already see the uh, the new slide. Um, maybe it takes a little yeah, bit yeah, yeah. for you to show up with you. Okay. Okay. Next slide. Thank you. And uh, uh, based uh, and RFC uh, eight, 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 three, uh, six, eight, uh using ACP to provide a stable. Uh, as in condition, but before finishing the connection to enterprise cap, uh, campus network, it is layer two system. So, uh, broadcast traffic will make loop in this network, like the right uh, figure described to host uh, X. Broadcast traffic, one loop will be made between switch A and uh, switch B, so lead to deploy loop breaking mechanism. Traditionally, STB is uh, famous, but because of STP complicated top uh, calculation, so the layer two network convergence very slow for large network automatic configuration, especially during onboarding, is not a good solution. Meantime, STB may miss some uh, device or may discover untrusted devices. This will cause terrible problem. Next slide. Click. Next. Yeah. So we think, uh, we, we think about layer two based call device, uh, device discovery protocol and uh, is standard in IEEE low lead control plane to calculate LDP protocol. LDP only receives packets and does forward them. To remote RDP packet is uh, only be between switch B and uh, switch A, but by this RDP doesn't cost uh, loop network and are about RDP frame forwarding plane already send them to CPU. This is ACP design behavior. So we can comply com combine ACP and uh, RDP together. Next. 
Next slide. Hello? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, for layer two, for layer two based SD, every legitimate uh, switch must be discovered. Even exist multiple layer of layer two can uh, negativity uh, like the right figure and are must avoid including any system into top top top. For example, desktops because this uh, system may have malware and uh, pretend to be a router in time because this is uh, autom this is autonomous network. So when power on. New switch need to be discovered automatically, and uh, whenever something changes, the discovery need to be continued too. Okay, next slide. I think the animation is running now. Next, yeah, next, uh, yes, a uh, new new system. Yeah, next. Okay, this is, and then to achieve ACP inside LDP. There are many the following process to do. Firstly, uh, in encapsulate IPv6 into LTP TRV system. Then, after receiving LTP packets, ACP will enable validly uh, ACP adjacent table to finish device uh, discovery. When, uh, once new uh, switches on board through Prisky and by the help of join proxy. New switches will be discovered. The next slide. Yes. Uh, here uh, we discuss. Uh, so uh, we we need to discuss RDP uh, encapsulation. Let's see as the the left left figure. The, okay. Okay. We turn back. We turn. Something happened to uh, sorry with the with the uh, I didn't do anything I didn't touch the notebook sorry for that okay 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 it's right it's right and uh, let let's see uh, RDP frame famous uh, RDP P PDU RP RDP RDP DU is uh, in the data error including the TRV header and the uh, IPv6 pa packet information because the the TRV information string in RDP frame famous has the limit of uh, 508 octets, but the uh, meaning IPv6 M2 is uh, 1280. So IPv6 payload needs to be uh, fragment. That is to say, RDP uh, IPv6 fragment contain more than one T TRV. This TRV include two pa uh, two pa points, sub-TRV type and uh, sub-TRV content. Okay, next. Click. Yeah, okay. Um, first one is a sub, uh, is a TRV type, sub-TRV type. Uh, to one IPv6 packet, multiple TRV use a different sub, sub different sub-type TRV value or repeat the same subtype TRV value many times. There are two this uh, solution to option two. Need to design how to keep multiple TRV with the correct order. I think this is more be more difficult to achieve. And the second is uh, issue is about content pay payload payload every fragment. For a fragment encapsulate entire IPv6 packet, including IPv6 header or lead the IPv6 header and, uh, and other by hard, co hard uh, code or compress them by mature RFC or other technology. There are three option solutions. Which solution is preferred? Need to compare and, uh, and, uh, and uh, analysis more. Uh, this is our draft's idea of Anima can act as work group's draft. Thank you. Any questions?
Thanks, Robert. Um, so I just have a question really about whether this overlaps in the mechanisms that IEEE already defines for sort of connecting switches together. So my understanding is like dot one Q, dot one AD already have some ability to um, self-discover the devices and self-configure themselves. Can I ask a question, Rob? Do they include uh, enrollment and um, uh, IDEV ID based authentication? The answer is I don't know. I would be surprised if they did. But I think uh, I think my question is more about whether we should be trying to speak to A22.1 working group to see if they have work in this area or if they'd have any concern with what we're doing here, or maybe that doesn't matter. Um, and my, my just thought is if they already have a mechanism for doing this, is there something that we can piggyback on rather than potentially reinventing the wheel? It's like different well. I think that's a good question. Um, I think ultimately we're trying to run V6 over uh, over a hot by hot protocol, uh, avoiding broadcasts or multicasts. Okay. I mean, it's, I think it's- So the... the easiest thing to do to answer that is probably to send a uh, email to the, coordination group between the IETF and IEEE 802. Um, it, I if then ask your the, badge on the WebEx. Uh, who's talking? Uh, Russ Housley. Thanks. Sorry, go on. So the simple thing to do is just send a note there, and if there is a need for a formal liaison or something like that, the it's easy to put together, but uh, we'll find out quickly whether that is needed or not. That's a great idea. Russ, am I right? I still think you chair that. Is that right? Yes, I do. Thanks. Good you know about it. There are no more questions on this presentation. Actually, Michael, I put myself in the queue. Uh, this is Eric Vink here. Oh, there. Sorry, I overlooked it. Please. No problem. Uh, about IPv6 over LLDP, this is kind of interesting, of course. But uh, my understanding is that LLDP is not indeed forwarded by switches, not based on the fact it's LLDP but based because the destination MAC address is a very specific one. So, of course, a lot of things need to be synchronized, like Russ say, with IEEE, uh, but uh, my understanding is that we do not need to get a specific encapsulation in the TLV there. Because the, the trick is not uh, LLDP, the trick is the destination MAC address. To be confirmed, of course, and to be confirmed whether it would be working like this. I think what you're saying is that uh, we could get the same effect with the with a, a specific destination MAC address and without the same uh, um, ether type. Um, and if that's the case, then we could try something else. Um, but LLDP itself, however, it gets there, gets up to the control plane, and that's actually the property we really want. Bypasses all of the forwarding mechanism of the of in the forwarding plane ASIC, and goes straight up to the control plane. And we're really which which means that we we're completely divorced from however configured or misconfigured the ASIC is. And so we always get the the out of band channel that we want, or the in band out of band control that we want for the ACP. Does that makes sense. Let me, so let me uh, also make a, a a suggestion here, right? So. It would be very good, and I think to me, you know, as an individual contributor, you know, that, that would be my, my, you know, suggestion to have a comparison of this mechanism with the ACP uh, over or for L2 switches that is in the ACP document itself, right? Because that basically is an existing uh, solution option, and I think, you know, every reader would like to understand 
what the difference and benefits are of this approach. Okay. Are we done? All right. And I think we're up for a delegated authority for bootstrap voucher artifacts. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, okay, and, uh, and another draft about uh, our team is a uh, is denigrated uh, authority for for bootstrap feature and the legs. Okay, <clears throat> in Brisky architecture, uh, manufacturers feature format based on uh, based on RFC eight three double six and require a master system to provide a, a feature for every device. Usually, this master is uh, manufacturer's original surface, mapping the uh, device dev ID later, there are no change to, uh, no chance to another master. So, block, so this block uh, secondary uh, sales. Mostly, basically need master must be re reachable to register during onboarding and the device owner is strongly trust the massa surface. For some office uh, of for some uh, uh, offline cases, although SDB can work better, but uh, it it doesn't re uh, resolve resell resell issue the same. Next. Next. Yeah. Second, uh, second sale exists many cases. For example, due to creditor or bank ramp, uh, reputed manufacturer defi uh, device transfer to winning seller later. Another example for a cloud or public uh, KPI the register we wish to uh, change its CA at some time. This is resale. Like this slide diagram, the bottom, uh, bottom blue. Register must override MASA URL uh, contacting green registry for virtual. Here, the green re register is a delegation uh, authority. Next slide. Yes. And uh, uh, further, multiple, multiple resale uh, solution also exist, like this slide diagram, new pledge. Pledge need to receive three purchases with the order chain. Massa is a uh, delegation one, D2, then resale zero. From real operation, resale can't be uh, forever, so may need to limit resale's number. This is ma uh, multi resale. Next. Uh, uh, another delegation feature uh, scenario is assembly. Like this uh, slide diagram, assembly control is so manufacturers feature should three as all delegation options. Like this, uh, play M two massa. Okay, next slide. Click. Uh, some IB transparent like diagram firstly uh, require assembly on board normally get its yellow feature by the order order step one, then step two and uh, and uh, Return back feature on step, step three. Secondly, uh, somebody act as the device to register. register. Then the page feature by the step three. Step, step five. This is transparent assembly uh, scenario. Okay, next slide.
Lest. So for resale and assemblies, assembly uh, scenario, we propose to share to shape current furniture uh, model. Uh, the uh, upper is uh, the, uh, the the standard furniture, and the the bottom is our proposed solution. Next, uh, next is, as can see, uh, uh, from this slide we can see we. Uh, we hope to ex extend the delegation CA and add the flag whether the culture is uh, delegate, uh, delegated or not. And if if it if it be in delegated, uh, need give the in intermediate identity and the delegation times. Next, click. Yes, and uh, in our. And draft zero uh, gives the related uh, proposed intention about delegation, delegated feature, like the yellow, uh, ye 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 yellow mark. Okay, here at four and uh, and uh, and here we, uh, we give our uh, issues about about delegation feature is is uh, extension in terms whether is uh, right or not and uh, the. And uh, the other, because the feature have changed, so the pledge and the and the register may be enhancing. So, so uh, and here we give three issues to think about, and uh, and uh, ask for anima to review whether it is uh, uh, valuable for or not. It's okay. Thank you. Stephen, we're in the, uh, the queue. Yeah, I should turn uh, the mic. Sorry, uh, this is Stephen. Yeah, just going back to the slide where you mentioned the the third scenario with the transparent assembly. Uh, ju just from my understanding, this would basically resemble the functionality that was described in this marker clean draft. Is is that the same approach? Say stop if you want to see the slide, and I should do it. Can you say stop? That number no, that's one, yeah, I, no, the, the one uh, slide uh, six. Mm -hmm. so I, I am not sure that I'm not sure that smart cuckling would apply to this, but maybe. Uh, so uh, because this still assumes that the that this assumes that the mass of four, like we could still do Brewski AE for mass of four. Um, we could do smart cuckling for masses four, but for the the way in which the the one, two, and three ducklings are onboarded to the rail wagon registrar is uh, strictly local because the green registrar acting as a delegation authority issues those pink uh, vouchers. Okay. Okay. Understood. Okay. So so that that's a low that because the everything's local is localized so. I agree that it's, it's similar, but and it, and and I hope it's clear that you could have multiple layers of this, so that blue-ish registrar, the rail car, rail wagon registrar, uh, could be then doing this with the the rail, the train, right, the next level or whatever number of layers of encapsulation you have. But at the end of the day, all of the parts are in fact registered to the whatever the highest level registrar is there's not a layers of registrar there's it's other they're flat on a network and i think that's okay. the goal right okay and so we could in fact that. have we could in fact have secure communications between left front brake thing on bogey one with left front brake on bogey two and also the one at the back of the train if that's somehow made sense Clarifies it. Yep. Anybody else in the queue?
think uh, three times the charm. If, if you're already talking, uh, you must be muted. Can you hear me? No, we can hear you. Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, here, I'm um, here. A little present our, our third uh, draft again. The draft is give uh, full operation, operation, uh, operational consideration for. Next, no Next. Uh, you didn't want to say something to the reference slide number two? I'm on uh, slide number two, reference of Brewski Redis Company. Can you hear me? Yes. You don't want to look uh, at, uh, you uh, know, what you're seeing in, uh, in WebEx, but I'm telling the slide number, you know, later the number. Mm -hmm. About which first uh, architecture. And the first is a risk is implement the domain and the authorizing. Let's open the register. Internal, internal structure, it has around the common database, database uh, those in, in the funds connected to, with MASA and the southbound interface connected with uh, pledge and web-based management interface and the optional, optional uh, CA. Uh, correspondingly, PKI uh, recommendation database process and uh, uh, IPv6 collect address to uh, to pledge and uh, and and land land secu security we think lead to discuss deeply. Next, next. Yep, I'm on slide three now. Please yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. talk to it. Yeah, this is our. Uh, this is the first. Uh, the first consideration for register. Uh, for different cases, depending on the network scale or enterprise type, ISP network usually deploy multiple uh, log in different locations. So they practice with three type title, three type uh, PKI instructor due to register lead. Uh, Client certification for MASA and the server certification for EST at the same time. So remote, so recommend lock uh, NOC NOC uh, certificate for SCA, but for uh, enterprise network with if they if uh, if, if enterprise have multiple logs NOCs uh, NOC. So using Three type, type, type PKI is structured to to a single location with all if if a single location with all logs for operation operational com, uh, continue by install, installing root CA in uh, in one in in several VMs three title PPI is also feasible but for small homework three title three type PKI is redundant re Comment locate, uh, locate locate on user's own device. Uh, okay, next. Now on slide four, just a few seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. To uh, register database, it has two uh, data flow, which uh, for future. First request from pledge to MASA and the first return back from uh, MASA to pledge. So, register is the data, uh, the data 
is changing center for different use case maybe lead to design features calling mechanism completely uh, synchronize synchronize operation in the second in the second in, in the same thread in the same thread uh, the whole data place of depend on the threads timeout if it may be suitable for small uh, home network and uh, completely async asynchronous part one and part two are in different process so there will be a larger uh, be a higher latency but in the meantime I think Asynchronous provide secure uh, advantages internal facing ports never can take us to the internet, then have to less the uh, manicures influence and the part partition is secret register may be uh, suitable for middle uh, enterprise users. This is three options calling mechanism. Okay, next. Click now on slide five, just a few seconds. Okay, this three, uh, the third consideration about ACP addressing, addressing uh, based on Brisky IPv6 link local on pledge ACP connection uh, make register must contain a, a unique IPv6 address for uh, certifications. And the IPv6 address uh, have two types, uh, F equal one address and uh, F uh, equal zero address. So limit, so limit the loss number when click connect at of address. Like this is for play connecting pledge. Okay, next slide. Click now on slide six. Next, please wait. Registers uh, security two points need to first the internal facing register is LAN network can access a lot of IoT device. If some device exists uh, malware, this will exhaust the bandwidth between your policy and the register. The second issue is in the in home network in home uh, in home network which CA. Uh, CA key deploy locally. If CA, if CPE fail, the user need to uh, back uh, backup database. But for some reason, he failed. Then he will throw out, throw away his CPE. Then this will cause PKI key uh, lost and uh, and uh, let his uh, home device lost of control. This is two uh, security about. Uh, about about the register. Okay, next. Now on slide seven, please wait. Yeah, and uh, finally, uh, this slide I want to summarize register consideration. Uh, the first one is about is a uh, certificate issue for different use case. The second is uh, data pre data pre uh, process. Process mechanism synchronous or uh, or syn asynchronous is suitable for different uh, use case. The third is about ACP uh, IPv6 address based on device scale. Whether uh, whether recommend F um, equal one for most uh, enterprise and home F equal equal zero for ICP. The fourth is we think about two security points. DDoS or and uh, loss of key. Besides these two, maybe there are some uh, major topics. At the end, uh, does some parts or of registers considerations in this draft for uh, for 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 I fit into I IETF and uh, into Anima Anima uh, working group drafts. This is our uh, consideration about risky register. That's all. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. 
Um, maybe just a quick comment from my side. I haven't been able to get through all of this in detail. The uh, one of these last bullet points here, or, or one of the bullet points on um, slide seven. Um, I think that uh, the answer to question number one may depend on the uh, use case. So, for example, for ACP, um, the discussions about whether a uh, you know public PKI could be used for um, ACP certificates through Bruski um, is already in the ACP RFC. That was just uh, you know all part of the improvements in the last you know half a year uh, to make that clearer because uh, we were fairly clear that you need. Um, Private PKI, at least, you know, from where you start your trust anchors. Now that trust anchor can be uh, signed publicly, but um, it doesn't need to be and doesn't have a big benefit. But um, I would guess that depending on, you know, how you're using the certificates, um, and there may be similar answers that we may not be able to give just for Bruski registers, um, all the recommendations the same as uh, across all use cases. Any other questions? Um, right. So yeah. So these these polling the audience with respect to you know who has read the draft and you know um, whether you want to have working group adoption. That seems to be something we'll really start to have to figure out better. But uh, you know, please bring up you know the topic of this draft also on the working group and ask the question if uh, somebody has read it and uh, please comment on it or just say whether. People have read it so that uh, we can start vetting um, the interest of the uh, working group in this uh, somewhat more, right? So please, uh, you know, actively drive that for your draft. Oh, there it is. Uh, this question should be asked by us, the chairs. But actually, before that, we need to say more uh, discussing on this draft. Yeah. Yeah, but as I said, right on the on the, on the mailing list, right. So if we see the activity, you know that it's being discussed and that people have read it, right. It's always easy in the room to you know do a raise of hand who has read the draft. But I think that right now, where you know, the other virtual interims also didn't feel confident of uh, assuming that this would work pretty well in um, in WebEx. So that's that's a little bit the challenge we'll have to adopt to, and so I think it. It's even more important for you know the authors of the drafts to basically raise the activity in the working group about their draft so that that we can do that vetting solely from the mailing list. Okay. So Okay, so I think uh, Wei, is that you? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Good. Uh, uh, I'm Wei Pan from Huawei. Uh, this is uh, uh, the operational consideration for Masa, and. Uh, here, um, there are. Two aspects of the relationship between the device and the manufacturer. Uh, first is that the manufacturer provisions an identity, aka IDEV ID for the device. So this device identity is validated by the MASA before issuing the voucher. Uh, the later consideration includes uh, the key pair generation and the PKA for IDEV ID. The other aspect is that the manufacturer provides our mechanism. Uh, this mechanism will convince the device to trust the new owner. So the device can validate that the voucher is issued by a legitimate master. So and the consideration includes uh, the PKI for master signing keys and uh, uh, some different uh, master types. Next, please. Rolling to slide three, and here we are. Slide three. Okay. Uh, about the operational consideration for IDEV ID, first part is the key pair generation. And uh, we think, uh, technically, there are three kinds of generation method. First is uh, on device key pair generation and off device key pair generation. And uh, key pair generation based on our 
256 bits. We, so we want to have a better, uh, better name for this, but maybe later. Uh, next, please. Scrolling to slide four. Thank you, slide four. Okay. Uh, about the own device TPA generation case, uh, the key the key generated on the device during manufacturer time, and so the private key will never leave the device. And the device uh, uh, conveys public key to the manufacturer, and the manufacturer uh, issues a certificate and records the certificate and returns uh, this certificate to the device. Um, this kind. Um, but there are disadvantages that the device may not have a verified random number generator, so the randomness may not be guaranteed. Uh, next. And slide five. About the off device KPI generation, uh, typically the, uh, it is stated that the manufacturer generate the key pair and uh, the issue the certificate and uh, install the private key and the certificate to the device. The device just needs to store this private key and the certificate. Uh, the advantage is that uh, manufacture uh, infra infrastructure to uh, generate a better with a, a private a private key a key pair with better randomness. And the authenticity of the public key is also well known to the manufacturer. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, but the private key is seen by the manufacturer infra infrastructure. So this infrastructure will becomes a more valuable uh, target. And uh, next, please. Slide six. Uh, the third method is that uh, um, uh, when the manufacturer builds the uh, uh, makes the device and uh, when to use some like silico fabrication and uh, this silico fabrication um, uh, a unique secret speed and also this secret key is provisioned to CPU to the device and uh, is revealed to the OEM. Uh, so the OE, so the manufacturer uh, and the, the uh, device can both uh, generate the key pair, but uh, separately. And uh, uh, the manufacturer, after the manufacturer generated generated the key, uh, it will it can it will display the pop, uh, private key and issue a certificate, and uh, it uh, returns the certificate to the device. So. Uh, the trust, so in this case, the trust is replaced with a heightened uh, trust placed in the silicon fabrication fa facility. And uh, uh, the key, key, uh, key uh, derivation system can be completely disconnected from the networks because uh, they can both do the, do the key generation uh, without connecting to each other. And uh, 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 but this, OEM, the manufacturer, must be supplied by a trusted silicon fabrication system with this secu uh, unique uh, security speed. And uh, OEM, the manufacturer, must uh, store and care for this piece very carefully. And uh, this is a burden uh, for the. Seven. Uh, about the PKI for the IDEV ID after the key pair generated and uh, when the manufacturer wants to uh, issue a certificate, a three-tier PKI in instructor is, appropri is appropriate. Uh, maybe someone say this is properly a the EE certificate should not be counted as a tier, uh, but uh, uh, this is a case, the picture uh, below is a case uh, there, the the bottom is a root certificate, and uh, a root CA uh, issues intermediate CA, and the, the private key of the root CA should be kept offline uh, to uh, to to pr uh, to pr uh, provide.
provide uh, uh, safety. And uh, a number of intermediate CA have the online private keys and they will issue the ID certificate. And they can periodically destroy the private keys and uh, generate a new one. And, uh, and the and, and the entity certificate is a uh, item ID certificate. Uh, next, please. Slide eight. Okay. Uh, next part is about the operational consideration for Marasa. Uh, first, uh, there are three, uh, four types of uh, uh, cases, four cases we want to dis uh, describe. And uh, first is about the uh, multi product massa. Uh, this case is that uh, there is a offline CA and the CA's private key is kept offline uh, in the safe, uh, like the uh, in some kind of safe in the left, left box. And uh, it will periodically sign a new and the entity certificate. It is this is the Martha certificate uh, in the you can see in the middle middle box. And uh, uh, the MASA use this uh, uh, use the PE certificates uh, online private key to issue voucher for the device. And uh, you can see uh, is uh, our manufacturer level MASA, and uh, uh, the manufacturer maybe have may have several product lines, and uh, it will have only one MASA. And this MASA issue vouchers for different types. Uh, different types of products. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is a case. And uh, next, please. Click slide nine. Uh, next, uh, th this case is our simple enhancement of the previous set case. Uh, this case has our unique MASA offline key for each product line. So, you can see the picture. Uh, <clears throat> for product line A, there will be our uh, CA offline CA, and for uh, uh, and this CA issues our uh, uh, MASA uh, <clears throat> E certificate for the MASA one, <clears throat> and uh, this MASA one will uh, issue vouchers for device which uh, has a common type A, and uh, uh, <clears throat> for different type our uh, product line B, there was they will have our second MASA, MASA 2, and uh, uh, our second uh, uh, CA2. So this is the case. And uh, so the private keys uh, are kept separately. Uh, so one, uh, the compromise of a single product line, MASA, doesn't comprise all products. And uh, if one product line is sold to another entity, and uh, the MASA is crow, uh, process affects only this single product line and uh, the serial number of the products of the device can be duplicated among different product lines but is uh, this requires a private key to be restored uh, per uh, for each product line and uh, uh, but this is uh, a case which are we think uh, it is encouraged uh, next please slide 10 And this this case is that the uh, also is a pro, uh, per product massa, and but the massa key is interwinted with the ID by the PKI, uh, which means that the uh, use the same massa certificate and the ID of ID certificate. You can see the picture. Uh, our root CA uh, signs three uh, uh, intermediate CAs, and the CA one is for device type A and uh, uh, CA2 uh, issues are certificate for device two, and uh, issue, uh, CA3 issues uh, the certificate for MASA. But the the, the problem is that uh, uh, for uh, for device two, charge which one is authorized to sign the vouchers because uh, when you validate the certificate chain, uh, if the device one uh, uh, issues uh, signs a voucher, uh, the the certificate, the certificate, certificate chain is can also be validated, but the device one is unauthorized to sign vouchers. So this is a 
uh, problem that uh, uh, the manufacturer need to consider. Uh, next. Slide 11. Okay. Uh, here is that uh, another enhancement is that uh, for each product line, you may have multiple master offload keys. So uh, you can use these keys to uh, in a rotated uh, uh, man uh, manner to uh, sign for the device. Uh, but this um, but this is not very uh, uh, convenient because all of the master signing keys need to be online and available, and uh, uh, we need the man manufacturer need to keep track of which device trust which key in the asset database. Next, please. Slide twelve. Uh, okay, uh, the final uh, page. Uh, we welcome more reviews and the comments and uh, does this uh, that do you think this your this work fit into the ITF and into anima and uh, that's all thank you very much questions on my 15 I don't see anybody in the queue please uh, speak up The next step it's going to be me. Okay, wanted to give update on the um, uh, status of the ACP. So um, around uh, ITF 106, we had uh, version uh, dash 21. Uh, we had uh, gone through the security review by. Ben, uh, with the RFC 822 name, hopefully having been the um, only discussed that was kept, op uh, kept, kept open. Um, and uh, then a new area director was assigned to the document, Eric Vinke, um, because Ignas, uh, who was the area director at that point in time, had to excuse himself. Um, and uh, because of the uh, term ends of IESG members, um, IESG reviews um, expired. So the process that Eric uh, was starting then provide his review um, and then second ITF last call and then back for final approval by ISG and um, um, so basically the uh, review from Eric came in January February March I uh, pushed out 24 in the meantime since then I also got uh, the review by Russ Housley I'm uh, still working on and discussions with IPsec experts also uh, Michael very much helping on that thank you very much um, and uh, the uh, document is now in the second ITF last call from uh, Eric. And um, I wanted to quickly summarize the uh, changes uh, that were uh, done in uh, February, March. Um, so the 822 name discuss is still open. Um, so now Russ has also uh, chimed in with the uh, statement from Ben that uh, using RFC 822 name seems wrong, but I haven't seen any good, you know, technical um, support for this. So that's that's going to be part, I think, of, of, of the discussion we need to have. And there is a long um, section of, uh, you know, uh, reasons for doing this choice from a, a lot of operational reasons in section 612. So I think uh, it would be good to get to that technical level of um, arguing about the pro and cons. I haven't seen any, you know, supporting arguments that there is really anything in an RFC says we can't do it. it was just i think other you know preference choices by the people and i think uh, you know the document right now very much reflects the operational preference choices uh, from the working group and the uh, implementations that we have seen um yeah so i'll uh, i'm going to finalize that review in the next few days to to Russ and try to upload 25 there is also some of the ipsec discussions that we had there needs to be very careful removal some of redundant text um, that we had about, you know, refining the profile uh, versus um, the IP, I, IP2. So I didn't want to rush that uh, to make sure it's it's uh, done correctly. Um, so the major changes from 21 to 24 beyond these uh, open issues, 
Um, so I hope that the overall security section for the secure channels is a lot more well structured because I've pulled out what really is applicable to all secure channels from the IPsec section. So um, things like that there is no MTI protocol that you know the security for the weakest link is what the weakest link is what determines the security of the overall ACP. So there needs to be a common um, lower lowest lowest common security level across all the secure channel protocols being used um, and these points that we can reuse physical link security or uh, reuse existing l2 encryption um, if available so that that's basically to these common requirements forward secrecy um, suggested lowest common denominator of security for 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 the data packets as 250 256 actually sorry about that um, explicit closure of the channels upon authentication expiry, right? If certificates expire, the uh, secure channels need to be closed. Um, and then also um, the suggestion to create strict profiles for any new channel protocols um, because, and that's what we've went through in, in IPsec, uh, the current profiles very often have a lot of legacy in them uh, that really would make implementation hardware forwarding uh, complex if you start new, right? If you have old implementation, of course, it's fine, but we want to enable new players in the market to implement ACP and hardware, then um, basically we need to uh, uh, make sure that we do as little as possible requirements, right? And there is no interop requirement with older stuff whenever we do it. So that basically leads to the IPsec profile, which is split up uh, in between the uh, um, ESP, Profile actually for the forwarding plane, uh, which based on 82, uh, 8221 RFC. So I'm, I'm not going to go through the details there, except saying that there is a single MTI uh, um, mechanisms and uh, discussions on how there is a should based on performance for the others. Now on the control plane, um, sorry, there's another typo here. Um, the the IQ2 um, BCP. RFC um, that that uh, specification primarily says um, to use ACP certificates, uh, how to put them into the uh, IQ2 signaling and uh, must use digital signature. Um, so, so that's basically where I think there are some additional text that we have there that needs to be stripped. Um, but overall, we're not really trying to, you know, not mandate anything that's in A two to one because still seems that simply reusing any existing software implementation, however many options it has, is the safer starting point than trying to come up with more strict profiles. And it doesn't have a performance impact like in the data plane with ESP. Um, there's a new section on the real-time clock. So that was pretty much stolen from Bruski and just adopted and effectively, um, you know, there may be, you know, issues when you do not have a real-time clock and you do start um, uh, with uh, just, you know, trusting that certificates presented to you are uh, valid because you don't have a better clock. Um, and uh, then going back to actually um, getting trustworthy clock through the ACP. Um, so this section now uh, writes this down. Um, DTLS, secondary um, ACP channel protocol. So uh, this, this was very much upgraded to uh, mention DTLS 1.3. Um, once it is an RFC, so because we really don't benefit a lot from uh, any DTLS 1.3 improvements, the profile already is uh, fairly close to DTLS 1.3 from the security sides, and um, we, we don't really want to blocking against DTLS 1.3, but there is an uh, RFC author note that will change uh, this to be a, um, a must for DTLS 1.3 um, once uh, there is an RFC before we're in, in, in auth 48 for, for the ACP. Um, and, and the main reason, of course, is that we can't simply strip out DTLS 1.2 because in the space of routers, firmware, of devices where you want ACP implementations, you know, the, the prediction is very easily that DTLS 1.2 will uh, probably stay the only available software for a longer time than we see that in, let's say, the space of web applications. Um, similarly for TLS, uh, which is used end-to-end -end, uh, for uh, securing GRASP inside the ACP, must TLS, should uh, TLS 1.3, um, small limited profile of crypto, 
Um, and so the goal for the profile was already to be as close uh, as we can with 1.2 to TLS 1.3 without expecting that all ACP devices support TLS 1.3. And hopefully, you know, um, that, that it would be faster to, to recognize when TLS 1.3 is um, expected to be available across all the uh, candidate ACP devices and always a reminder that in an ops group, you know, trying to uh, stick to the standards that we have that are widely available is, you know, something of the pragmatic compromises that you know, in ops are quite important. Ripple, yeah, I, hopefully good, you know, uh, improvement on the text of all these Ripple data plane artifacts. You know, if, if you know something like SRV6, Ripple has multiple of those. So that was confusing to, to Eric and to me as well on the text side because uh, the drafts were quite confusing. Um, there is an improvement on the uh, better uh, uh, to better explain how the secure channels, the secure associations are mapped to the virtual interfaces. And then there was a rewrite of the ACP over L2 section because I think there was very little, if not none at all, review of that section before Eric. Um, and so the whole idea was to explain how it's easy on an a layer two switch to implement uh, the ACP at least in software without any new hardware forwarding requirements. Um, and that's purely done through, you know, uh, doing the right thing in GRASP and um, therefore allowing a software ACP in there. Um, and then uh, added requirements for filtering of these uh, data plane artifacts on ACP uh, access nodes. So th those were just, you know, cool functional improvements uh, that were there. There was a really very good review from, from Eric with a lot more textual and structural and other uh, improvements, but I didn't want to bother the time here of the working group with that. So thank you very much. Um, any questions on this? Uh, Teres, this is Shin. Um, I do have a actual management uh, question. Um, earlier you mentioned um, because the term uh, of AD, so uh, we actually lost some um, positions. For now, it seems we are short of at least seven positions. I mean, uh, the we we were there they had enough position, but um, since those eighties have down, we we lost their positions. Uh, that means we uh, we are going back to the ISP meeting again to uh, get the more position from the current eighties or what would it be? Uh, my, my and my my question is is the same, um, and it's actually kind of more to 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 Russ Housley, Eric, and Rob, who is this. I noticed that quite a number of people, uh, 80s, gave us no objections, or we have no record even from 80s that have been that are not new, and therefore we effectively have one yes from Terry that we need to replace, and one discuss. So it seems like. 1580s have basically said they're just leaving it to the one discuss and that's it. And I just don't understand if that's a typical thing now in the IESG. So this is Eric Ving speaking here. So it's not the first document that's coming back after one year or two years. And of course, ISG members have changed. It vastly depends upon the change of the document. If the document has been just changed, I don't know, five, ten percent, not a lot of things change, we simply come back in front of the telechat and people may change their point. And of course, people that are not there or cannot change or they don't count, and new ADs can vote on this. But in this case, pretty much like I have asked for a second last call, because the document has vastly changed. And thank you again, Toles, for addressing all those comments and working on it. It will come to another ballot, starting from scratch. Yeah, but so basically, but forget about the, the last one, and then the new one is coming. This is not rough consensus. This is this is uh, one veto because there are, there are no yeses. Um, and yeah. my, my call, my call. so that this is this is Russell. There will be a new ballot. There will be a new ballot, 
And as I'm the responsibility for this one by historical reason, I will obviously, as soon as the last call is finished and we all agree that we need to, to go forward, I will vote yes. The usual procedure, so you will get one yes, mine, at least. Michael, this is not unusual. This is Russ Hausman. It's often <clears throat> the case when a second last call is asked for that the ADs will throw away the old ballot and then do a new one based on the second last call. Okay. Um, any more? Uh, and by the way, there is a, in the, uh, in Dash 21, I removed the whole um, change log, which was already 20 pages long and did a summary of uh, what was changed from, um, you know, the start of the IESG process to the end of the IESG process. So I hope that people trying to review the difference will get a fairly good summary, except that from Dash 22 to now, there are still more detailed differences. So 9.59, not looking on the watch actually helps to uh, stay in a uh, schedule. Interesting. Um, any, any last closing word, uh, Sheng? Not from me, but uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure uh, when we'll have the next meeting. Uh, will that be another inter-meeting online or you know, we are scheduled for the next ATF? Yeah. yeah, I think right. my, my suggestion would be if uh, basically authors of, of, of certain documents feel that there is enough to discuss on the content of documents, please bring up that suggestion. We can always have interims and the more we're training virtually, the, the more helpful. So I think as working group chairs, we're uh, very happy to, to set up interims um, uh, for, for this. This is still using all the interim tools and then I think we'll wait once we get closer to Madrid, uh, what the plans are for, for Madrid and accordingly uh, um, plan for that, which probably will be a virtual meeting as well, right? Okay. Thank you very much. If anybody has missed to sign the blue sheets in the etherpad, please do this now, uh, still open and uh, then See you next time and uh, any author, please uh, have your you know, work actively discussed on the uh, mailing list. And thank you very much for attending. Thanks all, guys. See you next time. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Happy Easter.